Good evening. Uh, welcome to the Museum of the City of New York. I'm Fran Rosenfeld, the museum's director of public programs, and tonight we're thrilled to present New York's Historical Foodways, a panel with a truly stellar group of New York food experts. Scott Barton, Hazia Diner, Grace Young, Ben Moody Harney, um, in a conversation moderated by Julia Moskin. And then we're also gonna hear briefly later from cocktail historian Dave Arnold. And then following the talk, as I think everyone here must know, we're gonna invite you upstairs to the museum's rotunda, which is just one flight up, for a very special tasting. I, I'm very curious, does anyone here not know there was a tasting following this? Oh, I see hands, that's crazy, okay. So this is the very first program in our new Eat Your Heart Out series of talks, tastings, and beyond that accompanies the museum's brand new exhibition, Food in New York, Bigger Than the Plate. And this is up on the first floor. Uh, it will be open during the reception. You can't bring anything, uh, any cocktails inside. But um, it is an exhibition, a beautiful exhibition, that explores the city's complex food systems and networks and is curated by um, my colleague, Dr. Mancho Lopez, who is with us tonight. Um, congratulations to Mancho for a gorgeous exhibition opening. And... I'm sure he'd be happy to uh, stick around in between Manhattans, answer some questions. We're thrilled to be partnering with MOFAD, the Museum of Food and Drink, on five of our Eat Your Heart Out programs. Um, are there MOFAD members in the house tonight? So shy, but yes, I saw you. I really want to thank MOFAD's president, Nasli Parvizi, and their wonderful director of public programs, Sari Kamen, Kamen sorry, for their all their creativity and collaboration in putting on these talks and tastings. Um, you're going to hear from Sari in just a moment, uh, and she'll say a few more words. And I really want to mention two upcoming food-related programs uh, before I turn it over to her. The first is that on Thursday, October 6th, so in exactly two weeks, we're going to be screening Moonstruck in honor of its 35th anniversary. Now, what does this have to do with food? Well, if you remember, it, it really is a great food film and a real valentine to New York's Italian-American uh, cooking and culture. And it's going to be introduced. It's our last outdoor screening of the year. It will be introduced by um, food writer and personality and tour guide Joe DiStefano. Um, so please come to that. And then, really exciting, on November Thursday, November 17th, our next program with MOFAD, uh, Halal in the City is coming up, which is a fantastic talk with a bunch of different players and writers and observers and, and vendors on the halal, uh, New York's halal scene, followed, of course, by a great tasting. So that's November 17th. All I'm going to ask now is that you turn off anything that makes noise, and but post away uh, to the museum's hashtag, MCNY Live. MOFAD probably has a good one, too, which Sari will tell you. And now I'm going to uh, turn it over to Sari for a minute. Thank you so much, Fran. Hi, everyone. So I didn't get to see raise of hands if you're if you're here because you heard about it through MoFad. So do you mind just? Oh, that's so good. Yay! Just want to say hi, and to all our new friends, um, hello. So my name is Sari Kamen. I'm the director of public programs. Uh, it's so fantastic to be here. I really want to thank the Museum of the City of New York and Fran especially for this opportunity. Um, just want to let you know that we exist. Obviously, I think you like museums and hopefully you like food, which is why you're here. So I just want to make sure you um, know about us. We have a website, mofad.org. Like Fran said, we have five programs that are going to be happening in partnership here. And we do lots of other programs around the city as well in places like Essex Market and the Green Space downtown. Um, so check us out. We're on Instagram, at MoFad, and like I said, MoFad.org. So I'll see you upstairs after the talk for Cocktails and Oysters, and thank you for having me. Thanks, Sari. And I just want to say, if there are latecomers, I see some folks sitting on the steps. There's a whole empty front row, and it's the best seat in the house, so please come on up. I just want to uh, introduce our moderator for the evening, Julia Moskin, and she is going to... Um, 
introduce and have us get to know this, our speakers in turn. We're delighted to have Julia back at the museum. She's moderated many panels for us in the past. She's been a food staff reporter at the New York Times since 2004, part of the Pulitzer Prize winning team uh, that reported on workplace sexual harassment issues. She does food profiles and spots trends, and she's recently been investigating the best recipes for kitchen classics in her video column, Recipe Lab. And she, of course, has multiple recipes that appear in NYT Cooking. So I'm really honored to um, welcome Julia back and our entire panel. Um, and they'll come out right now. Hi, everyone. Um, so uh, we're going to start by having each of um, our esteemed panelists, um, I asked them each to tell a, uh, an untold story about New York food, because obviously, if you're here, you've already read a lot of the stories. Um, and I thought it would be great to explore some, some just new territory. Um, so uh, let's see, Moody, you're going to go first. Um, he's going to have to leave and go take care of the oysters um, after that, so don't be unnerved if he leaves the stage, and then the rest of us will stay and chat. And All right, introduce so yourself first. My name's Moody. Um, I run a oyster cart here in the city called Mother Shuckers. Um, we are all over the city now. We're in Brooklyn. Uh, we are opening up a location in Manhattan in April, and we're on Governor's Island, and um, you guys can just come up right now and come get some oysters. You know, during the weekend we'll be open Friday through Sunday at uh, Industry City and Saturday, Sunday, Governor's Island. So if you guys, you know, like what you see today, you guys can also come and pop up on me out there. Um, so what I'm gonna talk to you guys about today is New York City's oyster history. Um, the I'm gonna talk about New York City's oyster history. So um, I'm not sure if you guys really have ever thought about New York City's oyster past or our waterways really. Um, it's pretty bizarre that we all live inside of the city, but because of how the city's set up, we don't really have a relationship with the water around the city. So nobody's ever really been to, you know, the docks inside of Lower Manhattan unless you've been to South Street Seaport. But there's all of that boating culture that used to be around, you know, centered around such a huge uh, a, a huge island with so many partnering islands. You know, the fact that we're so far removed from the maritime is honestly pretty bizarre, if you think about it. But um, the reasoning why that is, is based off of how we've created our industry. So previously, our, our first industry that we had inside of New York City, when the Dutch people came here, was oystering. You know, oysters were here plentiful by the billion. So when you came to the coastline, you would actually see mountains of what the Dutch called middens, but that was actually piles of oyster shells that people had collected. And as opposed to throwing them on the floor, wherever that they ate them at, they would keep the shells in, their, in whatever that they had and carry them back to the coastline and drop them in specific locations so that the shells could be intentionally pushed back inside the water. The reason for that is because oysters actually require shells to repopulate themselves. So one oyster can repopulate by the million. They repopulate more similar to, to mushroom spores than to any um, animal that we're familiar with. And so in terms of uh, the, the ocean's real estate previously, the ocean's real estate, the, our, our waterway real estate was littered with oysters and based off of the oysters being in such large abundance, they were actually creating the nursery for whales, uh, turtles, dolphins, all of the food that the natives were actually getting was actually being controlled through that, uh, through the estuary by these oyster beds. And based off of uh, uh, carbon, carbon and oxygen reductions that the oysters are doing while they're filtering the water, the water was really, really clean here inside of New York City. And there was so much wildlife and just, you know, Hunts Point and all these different places that we, we don't realize how much that the New York City was actually a, 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 farm, a, a food capital. It was a food capital before we really destroyed that. And uh, the way that we destroyed that was through harvesting all the oysters and then creating uh, factories that were dumping, doing a lot of uh, 
you know, industrial revolution time period work. But previous to that, all of the water, all of our waterways, Long Island, Staten Island, New York City, they were all littered with oysters and um, really creating an ecosystem that was sustainable and feeding basically the entire world. They were selling New York City oysters. The Blue Point oyster was going to England where they were depleting their supplies. It was going to France where they were depleting their supplies. It was going all the way into the middle of America. And uh, during that time period, you know, people didn't really have ways, well, in the very, very beginnings, we, this is predating even canneries, you know? And uh, so there was, there, the way that people would keep their oysters was through smoking them or pickling them and they keep them inside of jars, you know? So this is uh, stoneware from the 1700s that uh, we can still find today as basically the relics of the initial American uh, product line, you know? The first, the first branded and product, product, I mean, the branded and labeled product that we have here really for like all intents and purposes was oysters, one of the first ones, because of how, uh, you know, how much of a delicacy, how much of an important food that that was previously, how much of a uh, unique food that it was, and it still is based off of the region that you grow it in or the region that you get your oysters from. And um, just something that we used to see real value in. Uh, we knew the value of the oyster previously. And uh, instead of hot dog carts, we had oyster carts all over New York City because people were, the, the average individual was sustaining themselves off of eating something that was really clean and nutritious, good for themselves and good for the environment to eat. So um, that's pretty much what my mission is, you know, reintroducing uh, everybody. Tell them a little bit about Thomas Downing. Yes. Yeah, so uh, there was a few uh, very, very wealthy and important African-American people during the um, 1700s that were involved in the oyster game. One person, like I was telling you about the stoneware, there was a man named Thomas Camera. So Thomas Camera was a potter and he was... And he was trained by some German people who were the first people that inside of New York City or in terms of American history, what we have documented, were creating stoneware in the form of German stoneware and selling it here inside of the United States. Um, Thomas Camerall was somebody that was owned by one of these uh, Cromwells that was, I think that was the name, Cro Cro Crolius or Cromwell, something like that. But this German family, he was owned by them, and then upon their death, the, the death of the person who owned him, they released him, and he continued to make pottery inside of that style. During that time period, Staten Island was just being formed at the same time period. Staten Island was actually an oystering town at the beginning of it. So there was a lot of black people in this area called Sandy Hook that were collecting oysters, and the whole entire lower of Manhattan was also black people that were oystering. There were oyster men that were basically creating their own townships, they were creating their own uh, living situations based off of this economy that was being stirred up by these oysters. One of those people is Thomas Downing. Thomas Downing was someone who was very instrumental in terms of what later became uh, the stock market as well as the person who really kind of made oysters go from being a street food to being kind of a fine dining thing. So during his time period, Thomas Downing was kind of a pioneer because he was somebody who he saw the value in uh, something that was a common man's food and turning that into something that was going to be very hard to act, you know, hard, hard to access, something that was kind of unique and special. And he turned that from, you know, something that everybody was able to get all the time into something that people were willing to gift. The Queen of England gifted this man for his pickled oysters that he sent to her. And so, you know, during a time period when all of these business deals, so, you know, I was saying about how uh, oysters and whales really were the initial New York City economy besides human being trade, all right? So uh, the initial trade that we were doing here was the, the natural resource that we had here, which was oysters by the billion, and then whales would come through this area as well, and we would use that whale blubber to light our lanterns and to light up our towns in the old days. So there was an extremely cr uh, critical, important food source was having something like oysters that have zinc, iron, copper, magnesium, all of the different things that you would basically need to slaughter an animal and drink its blood or eat its liver in order to get the same kind of uh, mineral content from. But 
you would also be able to have uh, these these whales, which were uh, very crucial to uh, how people were able to just light their towns and thrive and survive inside of those time periods. So <clears throat> for uh, all intents and purposes, these things that to us are so obscure of a thing, they were really, really, really important to New York City in the very beginning. And uh, by the barrel, we were sending out barrels and barrels and barrels of uh, whale blubber for oil, whale oil, and um, oyster in oysters in barrels as well as inside of these clay, these stoneware jars like I was explaining to you. And that was really like how the first American economy, the first New York City economy got started was through um, these trades that were happening inside of these uh, dive bars. And the dive bar meaning it was like the basement of the bar and you'd go dive inside the basement of the bar and then you'd be able to talk to the people that were in there and make your trades happen or you know discuss like I, I got this much fish I got this much oysters I got this much whale blubber that's how transactions initially happened um, Thomas Downing kind of made it more of a fine dining space where you know you didn't go inside of this brothel basically all intents and purposes that's what the dive bars were they were brothels you didn't have to go there with your you know wife or you didn't have to be the mayor of some new township that was being opened in another place and try to come collect your you know buy your your oysters and buy your uh well blubber for your town that way you could go into a nice fine dining a nice establishment where you weren't going to be looked at as a crazy person or like you know a scurrilous person and uh have bring your whole entire family and do the same business transaction make these different kind of transactions so this was really like the beginning of the stock market the beginning of american stock market anyway there was already a dutch one that was happening, East Indian Trading Company, but uh, in in the United States, we were really trying to just like it was kind of under the under the table, you know, it was like tea sh tea shop, bar shop, you know, uh, dive bar conversations. And so yeah, that's a little bit of New York City oyster history for you guys, and um, I'm gonna have some oysters for you to try upstairs in a little bit. Gonna go get shucking. Thank you. All right, so we'll just work our way back to me. So Grace, introduce yourself, please. I am Grace, can you hear me? Um, I am Grace Young. Um, I am a Chinese American cookbook author. Um, my books have been about um, preserving Chinese recipes that are at risk of being lost. Um, my primary focus has been um, writing my family's recipes. I come from a Cantonese background. I've done a lot of work about walks and preserving the tradition of stir frying. And in the last few years during the pandemic, I have uh, shifted my focus to trying to preserve and protect Manhattan's Chinatown and now Chinatowns all across the United States and AAPI mom and pop businesses because of all the anti-Asian hate crimes. Um, the story that, the untold story that I want to share with you today is in 1915, there was a, um, there was a court case which granted a Chinese restaurant owner the status of being a merchant. And this is very, very important because from the time the Chinese arrived in America, they faced enormous uh, discrimination. Uh, the Chinese first came, of course, to work uh, in the gold mines, and then they were um, brought in as cheap labor by the Americans to work on the railroads. And they very much wanted the Chinese to come, but once the Chinese came, uh, there was no way that people wanted the Chinese to integrate with American society. And um, in the 18, I mean, just immediately there was so much discrimination and animosity and hatred um, for the Chinese. There were, um, they were attacked, they were lynched, there were anti-Chinese riots. Um, and it culminates in 1882 with the Chinese Exclusion Act, which is the only time in American history that there has been an immigration law passed to bar a specific race or ethnicity. And um, from that point, Chinese people could not come into the United States. 
But in 1915, there was a case where a Chinese restaurant owner was given merchant status. And by merchant status, that meant that he could come in and out of the country and he could also bring in relatives. So it was a way to sidestep this Exclusion Act. And um, this is very, very important because in 1895 in New York City, I believe there were five or six Chinese restaurants. And by 1905, there were possibly 100. But after this court case, there were suddenly four times the amount of Chinese restaurants, and they brought in $87 million of revenue. And by 10 years later, by 1930, the number of Chinese restaurants had doubled, and they were bringing in $150 million. So this was a way that the Chinese could actually, um, as I said, sidestep the, uh, the Exclusion Act and bring in family and friends, but it also gave them an ability to finally earn a living. At that point, the only way that you can make a living in America for the Chinese was laundry or restaurant work. And to become, to, to attain the merchant status, you couldn't just open a restaurant. You had to open up a high quality restaurant. And this enabled Chinese, not just in New York City, but across the United States, there were chop suey parlors that opened in small towns and cities. So this is a very, very important change for New York City food. And so Chinese people, I assume, were not allowed to own businesses of any kind until then? Um, I think they could own laundries, but they could not integrate into any other area of American life. And I was read in some of Moody's work that um, th one of the reasons that so many of the oyster men were black were be was because black men couldn't own their own businesses at that time, of course, in New York. And so, like many other people who started with the street carts, and they were hugely important. Yeah, and so um, between this uh, court uh, ruling and the fact that there was suddenly a chop suey craze in America that, that happens towards the end of the 1890s into the 19. 20s or so, um, there was just this flourishing of chop suey restaurants that go right through the United States. Great. Well, we're going to come back to chop suey in a minute, but we're going to go to Hasia first. Okay. I'm Hasia Diner, and um, mm -hmm. I guess I'm, oh, sorry, I'm Hasia Diner, and uh, I guess I'm now Professor Emerita uh, from New York University, and um, I've specialized um, in immigration ethnic history and American Jewish history, so my two areas, and um, I think I'm here because I wrote a book called Hungering for America, which looked at three immigrant groups in the, uh, from the mid 19th century into the um, 1920s, 1930s, and um, it explored um, the ways in which um, for, it was Irish, Italians, and East European Jews, how their encounters with hunger in the places of origin shaped the ways in which they uh, created ethnicity, in a, eth particular ethnicity in America, uh, based on the uh, reality that food in America was by world standards, very inexpensive. Meat in particular was um, consumed all the time. And uh, they had a chance to uh, embrace new ways of uh, uh, cr uh, sustaining communities, families, and um, expressing who they were through food. Great, okay. <laughs> okay. I have questions about that too, but we'll come. Okay. <laughs> Hi, I'm Scott Alves Barton. Um, I have recently moved from New York to in Indiana and teaching at Notre Dame University. And my work m mostly has been in Northeastern Brazil, looking at the intersection of sacred and secular foodways in Afro-Brazilian communities. But I've done some work here in New York in various um, aspects of African-American, African diasporic history. And the piece I wanted to talk about is um, not related to who we know today, like Marcus Samuelson, or people we may have known like Edna Lewis, or Cleo Johns, or Sh um, Norma Shirley, earlier African-American chefs. 
in this city who made a name for themselves and for the cuisine of the diaspora, but people we don't really know. And I'm specifically thinking about, um, depending on if you're a uh, Christian, what you may call the festival of the divine spirit, the festival of the Holy Ghost or Corpus Christi, that's usually the last week of May. When this was a Dutch community, it was called, the common term was Pinkster. And Pinkster was a holiday that went on for about a, a week, more or less. And it's unique, I'm gonna read a little bit too because I wanna get it right. But it's unique in that as a celebration of the Holy Spirit, the third part of the Trinity, uh, it became not just a Dutch holiday, but became an Afro-Dutch holiday, and the African slaves took it over. And as Moody was saying, there's so much about the labor that is across all of our work that is often unseen and not about the celebrities that we laud today. And Pinkster, what was interesting to me is um, from something I'll read in a minute from 1826. It went through the 18th, 19th century and probably a little bit in the 17th. And it was ultimately outlawed because they saw it as being insurrectionist. We could think of Pinkster as a prototypical Juneteenth, though it happens earlier in the year. And in this holiday, um, there, as you can imagine, in terms of Dutch culture, there's beer and, and sausages and things like that. But in much like the Kalau vendors or the rice fritter vendors in New Orleans, there were times that the enslaved Africans could uh, find a little bit of extra time to forage. And I'll read some of the things they would forage because I want to get it right. This is from an 1862 book called The Market Assistant. And they would forage roots, berries, herbs, yellow or other birds, fish, clams, oysters to sell in the Catherine market to earn pocket money in anticipation of Pinkster. So they're coming from what we now call Queens, at that time was called Long Island, and coming across into lower Manhattan to make a little bit of extra money to celebrate Pinkster. And at Pinkster, they're making gingerbread, they're dying and, and selling boiled eggs, fruits, cakes, cheeses, crackers, apple toddies, of course, waffles for the Dutch roasting chickens, vegetable stews, black beans, and fried sweet potatoes, among other things. And so over time, the, for no reason that I've found, the Dutch allowed them to use the drum, the African drums that was outlawed, to uh, engage with their dances, to celebrate their culture. Native Americans started to surround the Pinkster celebration to see what the Africans were doing alongside the Dutch. And it was at that point that Albany saw that the people who were not European born could be coming together and be insurrectionists and put the kibosh on Pinkster. In the last 20 years, it's, uh, scholars have been studying it a long time, but particularly this year for the first time in the old Dutch church near Poughkeepsie, they had a full on Pinkster celebration in the Dutch church with the Pinkster players and a week of food and celebration. I encourage you at the end of May next year to look for it. It's a very interesting holiday that's all about food and African-American culture and Afro-Dutch culture. I had never heard of that before uh, yesterday. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> um, well, I feel like uh, let's, let's try to um, put you all together at first to talk about chop suey. Um, Grace, can you define for us really what it is? I mean, there are, I would say we probably all know that it's not authentic. Chinese food, obviously authentic <laughs> is a very charged term in food these days, but what is it? Um, so chop suey, um, let's say, uh, let's, maybe we should start with where it possibly began. Um, there are two different stories about its origin. Some people say that in San Francisco's Chinatown, some Americans were coming through Chinatown late at night and they stopped at a restaurant and they wanted to eat something and the cook said, no, no, close, no more food. And they begged him and he made, he put together a dish with just sort of leftovers and um, when they and they thought it was delicious, and when they asked him what what do you call this, he said chop suey. So the first Chinese that came to America were Cantonese. There is a term in Cantonese chop suey, which means leftovers, odds and ends. <laughs> so it's possible that he said chop suey, and they heard chop suey. <laughs> but you know that story is. 
who knows? We don't know. Then there's another story that there is a very, very famous uh, Chinese diplomat named Li, um, Li Hung Chang. And he came to America in 1896. He was in New York. He was staying at the Waldorf Astoria. And apparently, at one point, he got very tired of American food and asked his cook to make something. And the American press was really following his story because he was such a respected uh, diplomat. And they asked what he had eaten. And it was, again, someone said, chop suey. Um, and the American press covered it. And Chinese restaurants that were struggling at the time uh, took advantage of this publicity to say, we are serving <laughs> Li Hung Chang chop suey. Um, so then there are these stories that there were um, American, so th there, there has been so much uh, animosity against the Chinese. You know, they were forced to live in Chinatowns because as I said, Americans did not want them to live near them. And so they were slums and ghettos that they were forced, that, that became Chinatown. And in these areas, um, in the 1870s, 80s, there were adventurous Americans called Bohemians, you know, hipsters, who ventured into Chinatown and was very curious about the food. And if you understand New York at this period, apparently, only the wealthy went to restaurants, that ordinary people didn't have the money to go to a restaurant. Yet in Chinatown, you could have a meal that was very inexpensive, and people really liked the taste of chop suey. Now, what is chop suey? It is a stir fry of normally bamboo shoots, um, bean sprouts, water chestnuts, celery, onions, um, but it can also have chicken or it can have pork, shrimp. I've seen pineapple chop suey. I've seen Chicago chop suey. Um, the thing is, is deep, as I is said to you, dish? my specialty is stir frying. And uh, the Chinese are very, very particular about what makes a great stir fry. And ingredients should be thinly sliced, delicately fine shred sometimes. Um, it should be seasoned with a little bit of ginger or garlic or scallions, you know, to punch up the flavors. When you uh, stir fry chicken, beef, pork, you must marinate it so that the meat is tender. But chop suey, when they made it, I've looked at so many different cookbooks in the 1920s, and the recipes are terrifying. <laughs> there, sometimes the recipe says that you start with just um, uh, a, a pan with oil, and then you just start cooking onions, bean sprout, and the cheapest vegetables possible. You know, the, the realm of incredible Chinese vegetables that you could possibly cook, you know, from snow peas to snow pea shoots uh, to Chinese broccoli, but these are only the cheapest, right? Onion, celery, um, sometimes uh, water chestnuts, and they didn't season it with ginger. I think the, the Americans at this period of time did not have, they had very plain palates. They liked meat and potatoes. And so um, cooking the vegetables, they would just eat, they would add slices of chicken, beef, pork that hadn't been marinated, and thick slices. Um, and then at the very end, they add a slurry because the American taste was they liked gravy or sauce. So they would put together a sauce made with cornstarch and probably broth or water, or sometimes soy sauce, not all the time. So there are chop suey dishes that are made that don't have soy sauce at all. And there's no ginger, there's no pronounced Cantonese, uh, Chinese uh, flavoring at all. And that was it. So for the Chinese who had been struggling to make a living, who had not been permitted into the workforce, that you could suddenly make this 
awful dish <laughs> that didn't require any skills and to make, and there was a craze. Like people wanted, they had to have their, their chop suey once or twice a week. And the New York Times writes about the fact that people have these addictions for chop suey and they must have it. That sounds like an impossible opium racist reference, but okay. <laughs> Um, so Scott, I know that your work obviously overlaps with this. You were talking um, about the in the 1910s and the 1920s in pe what people think of as the Harlem Renaissance, that chop suey joints were really popular then. So it's really interesting. If you know, um, in the early days of the Harlem Renaissance, when we look at the restaurants there and jazz clubs, there is a strict dividing line. Broadly, those that are black owned and those that are not. And the ones that are not black owned are often owned by people allegedly with mafia collect connections and um, non-black non, non owners who have some kind of money. And the ones you know that are like that are the, Sav the Savoy Ballroom and the Cotton Club. Or as Minton's, where Bebop was born, is a black owned club. So the food that we'd see at Minton's would be the food that people don't want today hogmaws and chitlins, not fried chicken and ribs. Maybe they had those too, but really subsistence level food because as Grace just said nicely, that people didn't really have the money to go out to eat. So you're really eating things that would be second cuts, etc. But you had quote unquote continental food at the Savoy and Cotton Club and other uh, clubs of that ilk. And my dad worked at some of those in fact, um, but blacks couldn't go to them. Duke Ellington, Count Basie performed, but blacks couldn't go. And the big dish was chop suey. And that made it seem that you were cosmopolitan. And if you, it, there's, unfortunately, there are not a lot of menus from these places um, during the Renaissance and the clubs in Harlem. There's a few at the Schomburg and a few at the New York Public Library's um, menu collection um, that Rebecca Fetterman manages. And she's a great scholar that you should all check out. Uh, but what we can see, there are existent many, the little bit that we have featured chop suey and put it kind of front and center, like we're really, we've arrived, we have chop suey. <laughs> <laughs> and um, Bahasia, obviously um, in your work on Jewish immigration, Chinese food is a great bond and a great bridge from one culture to another, but of course the question of kosher was a very new one for Jewish immigrants who lived here. What whether to eat Chinese food or not. So okay, let's great. just talk about that. Okay, it's a fabulous topic. It's a great uh, <laughs> connection. Um, so, um, you know, why and how um, this uh, um, uh, Jewish attraction for Chinese food uh, develops and what sustains us is um, still in the process of really being studied. And there's certainly anthropologists who've come up with um, what I would call cute answers like the, um, the uh, pork or the shrimp shrimp was very finely uh, chopped up, so uh, one wouldn't exactly see the offending uh, <laughs> uh, item. Um, the fact that these store, these um, uh, Chinese restaurants or chop suey joints were open on, um, on Sundays when everything else was closed uh, was, is another possible uh, answer. Um, but I think what's much more important, although again, there are scholars working on that right now, uh, um, is uh, the fact that this was noticed so early as a phenomenon. And so there are articles in um, English language Jewish magazines uh, from the 18, late 1880s and 1890s warning um, readers saying, don't be fooled, the food is not kosher. Uh, and they went on to say that there were rumors um, that the chicken that was used in uh, Chinese restaurants uh, were kosher slaughtered, and so therefore it was okay to eat it. And the uh, you know the editorial in the American Hebrew said you know avoid it is not uh, uh, it's not acceptable. But clearly nobody listened. <laughs> and um, by uh, the 1920s, it is such a uh, kind of institution or practice in uh, among American Jews, immigrants, the children of immigrants, um, that Sunday was a time to go and get Chinese food. And um, one of the Yiddish newspapers has a slightly tongue-in-cheek uh, uh, art feature article called The War Between Gefilte Fish and 
chop suey, and um, lamenting the passing of uh, kind of commitment to uh, what they defined as traditional food uh, to this. And here, I think, in part, is the explanation, this really American food. In other words, rather than associating it with uh, uh, some foreign culture, it was American. And the idea of American consumption was um, novelty. And the ability of uh, ordinary people um, to uh, eat what they wanted and to not feel the opprobrium of community officials telling them you can't eat it. And uh, so it was uh, the Americanness of it, which is a kind of uh, spin, as it were, on when we think about what is immigrant food, what is ethnic food, is that for people from uh, one place, what their uh, uh, neighbors from other places are serving seems very American. Okay, having come from places with quite homogenous food cultures and with relatively limited choices, America was a place where one could have almost anything. And so the most American thing was chop suey. Okay, and uh, so I think that it um, gives us a kind of peek into um, the idea of um, immigrants from all sorts of places uh, coming to the United States and um, seeing it, uh, having the opportunity to create uh, food practices which were uh, utterly new and unknown, and it to them symbolized the idea that they were no longer constricted or bound by the uh, constraints of the uh, of, of, of uh, what had had been tradition, they might in their own homes still keep kosher, for example. But going out. Okay, uh, and going out for Chinese was a very different uh, 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 matter. I guess I'm just going to ask one more question, and then we will have time to take a few questions from the audience, but not many, because your oysters are probably waiting. I mean, Grace, do you think overall was chop suey a good thing or not a good thing um, for the Chinese community? So I would say, uh, as a child, the moment I heard the word chop suey, I think I was in a cafeteria and somebody said, oh, they're serving chop suey today. You must eat that. And as a child, I already cringed. Just the, the sound of the word chop suey, and I knew that I didn't want any part of it. And when I saw what it looked like, it was disgusting to me. <laughs> and, and over the years, I have always like just steered clear of chop suey. I never tasted chop suey until I was writing my book, Stir Frying to the Sky's Edge, and I attended an event that served chop suey. And of course, I wasn't impressed. <laughs> but, but my attitude about chop suey has changed. And I now realize that chop suey was a gift to, China, to the Chinese Americans. And it allowed Chinese Americans to get a foothold in this country. And it allowed them to get accepted. That people talked about the fact that um, they didn't want anything to do with the Chinese people, but they were willing to with, with kind of like deal with the Chinese in order to get their chop suey. And chop suey was the first, I believe, the first American food craze that swept this country. Um, and it enabled Americans to go into a Chinese restaurant and to uh, experience different decor. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of these restaurants were really fancy. There was a restaurant, um, Port Arthur, in Manhattan's Chinatown that was so Fancy. It was the first one that uh, had a liquor license. They imported black tea, 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 teak wood from uh, Canton that was inlaid with mother of pearl. They had carved lanterns, you know. So Americans looked around and saw this Chinese paintings. They saw Chinese people dressed in traditional dress. Maybe the women wearing chong sam. Maybe they were listening to Chinese music in the background. And gradually, Chinese culture got absorbed into the American mainstream. And this is extremely important that they were able to finally 
um, eke out a living and and exist. Yeah, and I think as New Yorkers, we're all proud that New York has been the locus of so much of that, of the braiding together of different foods. All right, we're gonna take some questions. Um, all, all of these people do amazing work. I really recommend that you seek this out. I mean, this is just a tip of the iceberg of the things that they know. And if you're interested, still interested, Jennifer A. Lee, Andy Ko, and Young Chen have all written about chop suey. There are books you could read. Oh, well, does anyone have any questions for the panelists? Oh, here's someone. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned that chop suey was kind of the first food craze in America. Can you give any other examples? Like what are, were others? What followed? Um, Julia would probably know better than me um, about food crazes in this country, maybe. Well, does well, anything come to mind from? Well, I, you know, I'm not, sh I'm not sure what the word craze means. It's going to be interesting to discuss it. But certainly, if we think about, um, in, a, um, in a, a kind of broader term, the, um, the uh, kind of uh, accept the broad acceptance and the univers universalization of a food um, associated with a people that came from a, an immigrant population one that was, uh, in fact, looked down upon, that was viewed as suspicious, pizza. Yeah. And um, it's probably the most widely eaten food in the United States. In the world. Um, in the world, thank you. And um, the, uh, for the, what we understand to be pizza bears close to no resemblance okay, to its um, original dish in Naples. Okay. But it doesn't matter. And again, I think it's a question of, you know, was it good or bad? It, it was, in a way, the um, kind of calling card for Italians. We're giving this to you. you. Without us, you would have never had that. And so for people who, again, uh, were the objects of such uh, venom and uh, such... Uh, 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 kind of heinous language, and some of them are lynched also, to be able to have given that to Americans is a kind of uh, statement of, um, you know, you are, if you are what you eat and you eat pizza, okay, we've made you what you are. <laughs> <laughs> Scott, are there any examples from your work? I'm thinking of how fried chicken became American. Yeah, you know, I would say that's the most obvious one out of African American culture would be fried chicken. Um, which, you know, if you read Edna Lewis, she says she only fried chicken in the spring when it was young chicken. And if you have young chicken, it's very sweet as though it's sugared. Um, and she treated it as a seasonal product. But it, it's so ubiquitous now, people don't really, it's really about the crunch, it's not about the chicken almost. <laughs> <you know? laughs> and the, that whole war that happened with Popeyes and um, the other one, you know, she, uh, no, um, the one I don't, um, Chick-fil-A. Thank you. I didn't want, I don't like to name that name. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, really uh, emphasize how much people have seen that. And as we were talking be before we came on stage, it can, and this is, I think, with all of these foods, they can be placed in a, a position of honor and some, in some instances, like pizza, we can make beautiful renditions of it. Maybe chop suey can never be renovated to that level, um, but they can also be pejoratives, and they can also be as used as a tool to discriminate, and that becomes a real difficult edge that we have to slice. And I just want to say two things to you, Hasia. She made a statement that I think is very important. In the beginning of supermarkets in America, one of the things that changes us from going to these all these different grocers that you can a crew uh, buying things on time and and so much to a certain degree charge, everybody knows your business and you're obligated to eat the food of where you came from. And when we start to go to supermarkets, you can make your own choices. And the, the other thing I was gonna say to you that I thought was, that's a question, uh, you'll know it, I don't remember, but that show that's early 60s where there's a, a Jewish, kind of Jewish mother and she's always in the tenement, she's, it opens with her out the- Yeah, uh, the Goldbergs. Yeah. Did she eat chop suey? 
That's interesting. <laughs> I would have to go back to the high. So, but by the way, before it was on TV, it was a very popular radio, radio. show. Yeah. And, um, you know, I'd have to go back. But it's very interesting in a way in light with your um, kind of depiction of the decline of, of this dish that's kind of for Americans that no, bears no resemblance to the... Uh, what Chinese people would have eaten. There's a wonderful episode where uh, the word gets out that Molly makes great gefilte fish. And so a um, company comes to Molly and said, we want you to make it for a big, uh, for the market. And they take her to a test kitchen and she makes her gefilte fish. And it doesn't taste anything like what she made at home. And she refuses to uh, uh, um, give her, to cook it for this company. And so the idea is that this food, when it has to go public, becomes not what it was, mm. um, as it has to become palatable to a broad uh, market. That's fascinating. Yeah. But it would be great to go back to the Molly Goldberg show and see if <laughs> Chinese ever comes up. <laughs> Thank you all so much for coming. Thank, please, our panelists. A great one. That's a great question. That was a really good one. So that's a very good question. Thank you all so much. Don't miss your dinner reservations. It's edgy. Yeah, to edgy, me, edgy. Like, like to be, it allows me to be that quote unquote actor yeah. and really express themselves. Can you tell Sorry, everyone's so sorry. Oh, hold, up, hold, the, hold the phone. Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. I was watching the clock, and I knew we were supposed to be done, but we have Dave Arnold, a genius of mixology. Thank you so much. Hey, just real quick, so you know, uh, so you know what's, uh, what's going to happen. So they wanted to do uh, New York uh, history. Normally, I'm a tech guy, but they asked me to do history. Fine. Good. Uh, so uh, the Manhattan, obviously, named after Manhattan. Here we are. Uh, the first published recipe, I think, or one of the very first one within a, within a couple of months, 1884, O.H. Byron's uh, book, there's actually a compendium. There's no such guy. Uh, I've talked to Dave Wondrich about this. I've talked to a bunch of people. There's no such human, O.H. Byron. It's one of these things that a publishing house, Excelsior Publishing, kind of just scrabbled a bunch of stuff together, but it has the two first Manhattan recipes, but they're very bizarre. A lot of the old Manhattans actually, you guys know what a Manhattan is, by the way? Yeah. Okay, cool. For those... Right. For those of you that don't know, most of the time we use two parts whiskey, one part uh, sweet vermouth nowadays with Angostura bitters and cherry or orange. Cherry or but do you know who Dave Arnold is? Yeah. And I, I, I sling drinks. I, I also the founder of the Museum of Food and Drink. Thank you. So yeah. So. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So in the old days, in the, like in the 1880s, when the Manhattan was brand new, uh, they had a lot more vermouth in them because vermouth cocktails were a huge thing. And so the two recipes we have, one of them super bizarre. It actually uses dry vermouth, which I thought was going to be nasty because I hate the perfect Manhattan. I think it's the like it's one of those oxymorons. It's like it's like Greenland. You know what I mean? Uh, uh, but. Uh, it's all dry vermouth, and it's two parts dry vermouth to one part whiskey. And I was like, I'm going to make it, and I hate it. I actually enjoy it. So we have that. And there's also a one-to-one, -one, and we're using Martini and Rossi because it was one of the first vermouths in. I don't know if it tastes like it did back then, but it was one of the first vermouths in. The dry we're using is Noy Pratt, also one of the first vermouths in. So we have a one-to-one -one with Martini and Rossi, a two vermouth to one uh, up there, and then we have a little bit of a more modern one, so you can just compare. And that one, of course, we're going to put a cherry in. Good? Good? All right, thank you.